Welcome everyone. Uh, today is our EBC, which stands for Evidence-Based Coaching Professional Series webinar. And we have three panelists today, which will be introducing themselves in more detail. And today's topic is uh, Manager as Coach, How Incorporating Coaching Skills Transformed My Leadership. This is part of the Fielding Graduate University Coaching Community of Practice. And we welcome everyone who is on the call today and will be listening later on the recorded session. So uh, we have three uh, alumni and one student who will soon be an alum um, of the yeah. programs. Uh, we have Marianne Spatola, uh, and she is from the EBC program. We have John Hoover, who uh, graduated from the PhD program and is also faculty in the uh, master's program. And we have Kelly Pincus, uh, who is one of our current EBC students and very soon to be uh, alumni of, or alum of the program. So welcome all of you and uh, I'm Terry Hildebrandt. I'm the director of the evidence-based coaching program at Fielding and I'm also an alum. I'm an alum <laughs> of the EBC program as well as the PhD program and the master's program. Uh, so I'm uh, thrilled to be here to welcome our guests and we're gonna have a lively discussion. So I'm gonna start it off with asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves a little bit by answering uh, this question and of course talking about where they uh, are now and in their journey, where they work, where they live, uh, and then a little bit about how incorporating coaching into your leadership in organizations has had an impact uh, on your effectiveness as a leader. Mm -hmm. So let's start with uh, Kelly Pincus. Hi everybody and hi Terry. Um, so my name is Kelly Pincus, and I am currently uh, work for GSK, and I've been there uh, for a good long time. Um, it's one of the pharmaceutical companies, and I have been a uh, leader of people for about 10 years now with the corporation or with the company. Um, and so um, I live um, in North Carolina, and um, coaching is part of my leadership, which I am I think is, is the question that you're asking, Terry, is um, really been transformational for me as a leader. Um, when I first took uh, the, my first job um, in leading people, uh, the kind of the baseline presumption was a bit more of the mentoring and consulting thinking process. And um, through my journey as a leader and as, a, as really as a person, um, as I've learned more about coaching and had more exposure uh, both at work because it is highly encouraged for us to think of coaching as part of our leadership and is taught there, um, it really has given me some aha moments of the fact that it's more than just a skill, it's really a discipline, mm -hmm. and that it really has an impact in the way that one approaches others in any dialogues, um, inclusive of with my teammates. Um, so in my journey, um, I really feel like it's changed the conversations I have. I think I'm a much better support for, for my team and for colleagues. Um, and so um, I'll kind of hold from there, but but that's that's kind of the introduction of me. Great, thank you, thank you, Kelly. Yes. So let's hear from John Hoover or Dr. John Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Terry, and it's great to be here with Kelly and Mary Ann. And uh, actually, it was Kelly. I think did you attend the Prism Award in in New York City when GSK won it? Uh, no, I did not. But we, the presentation was made by Magda from from from. Uh, uh, from ICF. Okay. Uh, anyway, that was uh, quite a quite a wonderful event. A couple, two years ago, I think two years ago. So um, my my I'm in New York City, and I work for a firm called Partners in Human Resources International, and I supervise about 250 coaches around the world, which is our network globally, and we provide coaches anywhere and everywhere for all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> And I kind of commute back and forth, really, from New York to Florida. It's my favorite place to hang out when I'm not in New York. And um, I started coaching, actually, before most of the people on the call were born. <laughs> at Disney in the 80s, um, when, we were, when we were coaching people to become uh, leaders in Tokyo, when we opened up Tokyo Disneyland. So it goes back a long, long, long time. And it didn't become formal for me until um, I had gone through my marriage and family therapy degree, master's degree out in California, where I was working with Disney. And uh, then later became involved in ICF and got my ICF PCC and, and uh, then went to Fielding as well for the PhD and the second master's. 
in the 90s. So, you know, this all goes back quite a bit. Um, the, the broader answer to how it affects me, it's been evolutionary for me, how coaching has affected me because I've been like Mary Ann in many different roles uh, over the years and, and uh, sort of organizations and clients and client populations in many different ways. And so um, at the headline that I would address and then maybe um, break down as we go through the program today is that coaching has been most beneficial to me as a leader, as an SVP at, at Partners in Human Resources International and in other positions I've held um, by making me more self-aware of who I am. Because when I was in the, the Coaching Supervision Academy, uh, the initial North American cohort with Damien Goldvarg, and uh, I know that uh, I know that Terry is now part of the Coaching Supervision uh, America's organization. One of our mentors in in and founders of that organization um, mentored me, and and uh, was famous for saying that that how who we are is how we supervise, mm -hmm. and that of course. Yeah translated into how who we are is how we coach well who we are is how we manage and lead in organizations also mm -hmm. it's universally true so coaching because it increases self-awareness and really helps us to actualize um, the best of ourselves so that we bring all of ourselves and the best of ourselves to our jobs um, obviously has a direct impact on and who we are, and then subsequently how we lead in our leadership positions. So I'll leave it at that, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation as we get deeper into these kinds of things. <laughs> thank you, John. So Mary Ann, let's hear from you. Well, good morning, uh, and thank you to Terry for including me on this distinguished panel this morning. So I think it's going to be a great topic, and I'm looking forward to it. A um, little bit about me, I am currently the founder and CEO of a company called C3 Talent Strategies. And I started this company at uh, the beginning of the year when I left my corporate job, yay. Um, <laughs> after a long, long successful career in HR and other disciplines in business. So I've discovered coaching when I first fell into HR after being on the business side for a number of years, um, I think having started in the business gives me a very different perspective on what HR should and needs to be. And I was part of a startup organization where we built HR from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And I had a natural propensity for developing people. So my wheelhouse has been in organizational leadership, which is what I did my EBC certificate in at Fielding. Um, my belief about coaching, in, especially in organizations, is that it helps us to enable people to reach their fullest potential. Um, and when you align that as leaders to your business strategy is really how organizations get the best results. And we all know when organizations are winning, everybody wins. Everybody's happy. The organization is growing and thriving and people have opportunities to learn and grow. So that's been my um, penchant for my career side. I have been, as John mentioned, in a number of roles. So along my journey, I have been and continue to be an executive coach of my own. I am PC certified through ICF after finishing my fielding training. Um, I've also built coaching practices inside organizations and in consulting companies. And so I've got a long history of working with, for, and amongst coaches. Um, and I just really love the field. I think it's a dynamic part of life and our professions. And I think it tremendously helps organizations. On the personal side, um, a little funny story about my coaching journey is, you know, I have found the value of having coaching skills and found them to be even more valuable as you move up in rank. And so my last position, I made it to the top of my field as a SVP, CHRO. And prior to that, I was a VP of talent in other organizations. So when you're operating at that executive level, having good coaching skills is an imperative. 
And my little fun personal story is I actually landed a job by using coding skills on the interview. <laughs> the hiring manager was stuck on making a decision and kept asking me to come back. And I finally called the issue yeah. and said, listen, I think you're just stuck and you need to make a decision so you can move on. And if that's me, that's great. And if it's not, you need to move forward. So let's talk about what the real issue was and we unpacked what was in the way, cleared the smoke, and I got hired right there. Wow, what a great story. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you all for um, the introductions. It, it's clear that coaching's made a huge difference in all of your lives and the people around you. And uh, I'd like to expand on that a little bit with our second question, which is, why is coaching becoming so important for 21st century leaders? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll start. Great. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Um, so I'm also a professor adjunct at New York University in Manhattan. And I teach on uh, the topic of the future of work, the future of HR, and how we need to align those two things. And when you think about 21st century skills and how dramatically they will shift based on all of the automation artificial intelligence, the gig economy, we could go on just, we could do a whole webinar just on that, Terry. <laughs> um, but when you think about how the skill sets are shifting, coaching becomes an even more critical part of how we'll be successful, getting people to that 21st century career. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I wrote a post about it on LinkedIn last week because it was a topic in our class. And I included a research article from Deloitte called 21st Century Careers Catch the Wave. Mm. And the article talked a lot about careers that span a lifetime. And so looking at how boomers are not retiring, they just want to continue to work, work differently, but they want to continue to work. Mm. So what's really fascinating about my LinkedIn post, I checked it this morning. You ready? Mm. 368,000 wow. views. Wow. It's gone wild. It's been yeah. shared 27 times. It has been seen in Africa, Australia, France, Germany, India. It's Mexico. It's crazy. But I think what that says is we kind of struck a nerve about how dramatically careers will change, or skills will change, what reskilling needs to happen. And I think people are pretty nervous about it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah. Who'd like to go next? 21st century leaders, why is, why is coaching so important for them? Well, because um, I'll beg uh, Kelly's indulgence and follow up on that. Uh, interesting that, that we're both NYU people, Marianne. Yeah. <laughs> I used to teach some of uh, uh, Paul at Rayo's coaching classes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So you guys, I know, know each other very well, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, the 21st century is, you know, work is taking on an entirely new, I mean, we knew this at the latter part of the 20th century that that tenure in jobs was very short the average uh, length of uh, employment was three years i think before That's right. people moved on so the, the whole nature of employment and the whole relationship that employment has to an individual's lifestyle and life plans is vastly different now than it was uh not that very long ago so i think that simply amplifies uh, mm -hmm has a catalytic effect on the need for people to know who they are and what they want mm -hmm. because uh, the job market is so fluid and so volatile. So uh, uh, I agree. I'm going to go seek out your article <laughs> because it's, it is, it is spot on for and coaching and the, and the implications for coaching right. are monumental mm -hmm. because of the knowledge. I keep going back to the knowledge of self. Yes. And self-awareness, mm -hmm. which is the goal of coaching. So um, the, the two dimensions of that, I mean, it's more than just the chessboard. It's, I think it's two 
maybe even three-dimensional chess, the job market of the future, is knowing what's happening. One dimension of what's happening is what's happening in the job market, you know, mm -hmm. where labor is needed, where talent is needed. Um, and as jobs and certain calls for talent become extinct, new ones emerge. Yes. And so that's one plane. And then another dimension is who you are relative to the talent that's needed. Um, there are people who had skill sets um, 10 years ago that are no longer, you know, yep. necessary. And, and there's no market for it. And ergo, there's no economy to support it. And there are going to be job skill sets emerging in the next five to 10 years that we don't even, we're not even aware of now. Right. So it's extremely volatile, very mercurial. And uh, I think the third dimension is to know where you want to be in relationship to work and what work is going to mean to your life versus perhaps personal relationships, life relationships, family relationships. And those things are, are, are weaving together and forming a tapestry, um, which is very unique because with those dimensions, those multiple dimensions that we have to deal with, and the fact that they're constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. the, the nature and the threads that, that, that get woven together in our lives and, and in our careers, um, being so mercurial and volatile, um, to not be aware of who we are as individuals in the midst of it all, mm -hmm. and as intricate components of it all, uh, it's going to be, it would be very detrimental. Yeah. So it's so it's it's becoming the space age, you know, which is what we <laughs> I know, but uh, uh, something like we've never known before, and so the awareness of self simply becomes exponentially more important. Yeah, and to that point, because it is constantly evolving, coaching becomes even more imperative. Uh -huh. it's the only way we're going to start. You should see my students' faces when I tell them uh -huh. they're going to work for forty, fifty or 60 years of their life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, and, and for, for certain generations, um, that's that's pretty shocking news. I think they thought it was... Yeah, no, like not so much. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So Kelly, I'd love to hear your perspective as well on 21st yeah. century leaders. Yeah, Coaching in the 21st century, well, I totally agree with everything that's been said as far as the imperative and that the fact that this discipline and the skills associated with it are really what will propel or, you know, our teams and our organizations to be able to evolve quicker. Mm -hmm. The necessity for organizations to be nimble, for their, for their employees to be in a work environment where it's fostered to learn and relearn and reinvent is mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. And so creating a coaching environment and utilizing coaching is just part of the fabric of the culture allows that to become a norm. Mm -hmm. Because while somebody who like myself, I'm, I'm educating myself, many people won't go through this formalization, but the culture can be impacted mm -hmm. overall by a belief system that, that, that creating that type of space generates a highly empowered learning environment. So that's what I think um, from a, from initial blush on that, that question, because it's a great question. Um, and what I'm, and I, what I feel like I'm living to some extent. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Our, ne our next question is uh, what impact have you seen that coaching can have on the performance of individual employees I think we all know that uh, coaching as a, a leader often uh, in, includes coaching the direct reports that you have, uh, which we sometimes call this um, you know, managerial coaching uh, is what it's often called in the literature. But I'm just curious, uh, how have you seen that impact um, on individual employees? We are kind of at a crossroads. Maybe that's premature to say, but um, coaching has, has often been used, as you know, corporately uh, as a remedial practice for executives that, that get into positions of uh, great institutional authority before they're prepared 
<laughs> don't know themselves well enough and don't know the dynamics of relationships inside organizations, systems theory at work, um, to realize the impact they're having on other people. So, and that was true of me. I was a colossal idiot boss when I was at Disney many, many years ago. And I was very old school management at a time when, when we came to a crossroads and, and young people and more dynamic skill sets were required. And I was still trying to be an old school Mr. Diddler's kind of boss. Um, so that's, that's what led to my publishing the book, How to Work for an Idiot. It was the confessions of a recovering idiot boss. <laughs> and, um, and so as employers, we have such an, uh, employers, but, but leaders in organizations, um, we have a, a tremendous impact on, on the quality of life and the quality of career of the people that work for us. Okay. And all of that ties right back into what we're, being, what we're contributing in terms of profitability, performance, pr uh, productivity to the organizations we serve. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's why I, I, I went over there for a second and grabbed a book off the shelf, Terry, a shameless plug for my own book, Coaching from Sage Publishing. It's called Enterprise Wide Coaching, The Ten Commandments. This came out last May, I think May of 2017 from Sage. And, um, and I use it in a lot of the courses I teach at Fielding and, and at NYU. The... Um, uh, Point being that coaching can't, we've tried for years to make coaching part of the culture in organizations. And it's felt for years like you're fighting an uphill battle because the, the organization wants to do business the way the organization wants to be old school and do business in a very hierarchical span of control kind of mentality. And younger generations of brilliant, skilled, um, but more or less undirected workers and talent um, just don't resonate with that. Mm -hmm. And so not only do leaders need to know who they are, the individuals working in all the various dimensions of the organization need to know who they are. And the self-awareness that I was speaking of earlier just simply has to permeate the entire organizations. And it's interesting because younger organizations, I was just at Google yesterday, um, uh, you know, you run around that, that the halls of that organization and, and um, of course, at Google, I, at my age, feel like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, they're so young and they're so bright and remarkably intelligent and creating things that I've never even imagined and, and I couldn't speak their, their computer software languages if my life depended on it, but they just are conversant and, and, and fluid and lucid and all those things. That, that, that I will never live long enough to see um, play out in their entireties. And so who they are in the organization is a much more flat, you know, we've struggled for years to make, create flat organizations. Well, they by nature have to be flat because the people, the code warriors who write code and create the platforms that we take for granted every day when we go to an ATM machine or we go on our computers and, or, or anywhere that we encounter um, uh, digital technology, these are the people that, that, that control it. They create it and they recreate it constantly. And uh, so as we look into the future, uh, co coaching has to be a part of or some form or manifestation of coaching that the, the creation of self-awareness, the, the facilitation of self-awareness and, and who we are and who we are. And that's the reason I wrote that particular book was because who you are relative to the organization that you're working in, in the context of the organization is very, very important. I, you know, coach people at Prudential Insurance in Newark, New Jersey, and that's a very buttoned up, uh, you know, Barney's of New York suit and tie culture. And the same things that apply there culturally would not apply at Google for 10 seconds, mm -mm. wholly different culture. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the adaptability of leaders uh, on that, that three-dimensional chessboard, it's the adaptability of everybody in the organization. It's constantly moving. Leadership is no longer hierarchical. Organizations are no longer hierarchical. They're molecular. They're spinning and atoms and neutrons and everything are going everywhere all the time. And so that just 
as Marianne said a moment ago, enhances the need, just accelerates it, it, gives, it has a catalytic effect on the need for people to be aware, to be constantly aware, and to be, to one of Kelly's points, learning, learning and learning and learning and never stop learning. We used to talk about, back in the 90s and the 80s, we talked about, um, uh, you know, the learning organization, Senge and, and Harry Rubin, her, his editor over at, uh, at that time, Harper Collins, we're talking about a continuous learning in the organization, right? The fifth dimension. That's just taken for granted now. That's not a luxury. That's something we can do or not do. We have to do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things are thrust upon us. A lot of the needs for coaching and coaching the craft itself mm -hmm. has to evolve with its population as the population evolves. That's very true. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll follow on to John. Um, I would agree and add that in my experience, building coaching practices yeah. in organizations yeah. that it, my mo the most success I've had is in embedding coaching in what I would call the ecosystem of learning with, to John's point, within the context of the organization. Um, one organization that I worked in uh, had a similar challenge. They were absolutely using it for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. meaning people who were the last step out the door. Corrective, yeah. Uh, but also they had so-called coaches in the building that really were not coaches. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to refer to one gentleman as a carrier pigeon because all he did was interview people and then go tell everybody else what that person had to say. Oh my gosh. And then would report back to the CEO on all of it. Mm -hmm. So it was despicably dangerous um, and not productive or healthy. And so what I did was create true coaching experiences for people so they could understand what coaching really was, what the process was like, how it worked, what the benefits would be. And I built my own little coalition of people who had that experience. And then therefore, when the so-called coach finally self-destructed, thankfully, um, he was able to exit the organization. And then the others who I'd been working with were my advocates when I went to the CEO and said, let's talk about what this really should be, how we can use it, how it helps individuals and the organization. We used uh, coaching very successfully in succession planning, in our leadership uh, first-time supervisor programs, um, as follow-up to 360 reports. So again, we built a, an ecosystem of which coaching was embedded in that. And when you execute it on coaching in the right way, it had tremendous benefits for the individual as well as the organization. Enterprise-wide. Absolutely. No one's exempt. No, shouldn't be. No. Yeah. And it needs to be on the fly. Mm -hmm. That's the other yeah. you know, we, Emerging was yeah. important. Yeah. We think of coaching typically, the, traditionally, you know, as this, this, this little private you know, uh, a session going on behind the veil of, of confidentiality, um, yeah. you know, the, the cone of confidentiality, mm -hmm. uh, which is still true, very important concepts in, in, in the craft of coaching. But the fact is, coaching is not just session by session by session as much as now it's becoming, and I think of Google, the beehive that Google is, uh, Google YouTube here in New York City, um, is coaching on the fly. Yeah. You're coaching when you're at lunch, you're coaching when you're in the elevator, you're coaching, you know, the principles of coaching, just the, the very under underlying and underpinning principles of the craft mm -hmm. are valuable everywhere in every interaction. And yeah. the interactions are happening everywhere all the time. Yep. Yeah, and that's what I think that's what I see with regards to when you get down to people actually interacting with people, right? Yeah. yeah. And if you really just think about what the principles are in general it should be transformational if a culture goes that direction. A culture where people are listening. They're present when they're having dialogues, right? 
They're yeah. allowing a thoughtful direct communication, which is a huge one to me. And it's been probably one of my biggest learnings through the coaching process that I've had, even with fielding yeah. is how that can look. Um, so when you get down, because really organizations are people and therefore how they end up working to your point day by day with each other impacts everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that um, I find interesting, there's a new organization I've been involved with. Uh, well, it's actually not so new, uh, but uh, becoming more well-known, the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. And they, uh, they describe their master certified executive coach as an enterprise-wide uh, business partner, mm -hmm. right? Where uh, it's a, a different way of thinking about coaching, especially at the executive and leadership level where you are uh, coaching the whole system, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the old days, we would probably call it organizational development, but we've uh, taken it to a new level, I think, with adding coaching principles to some of, to, to the field of OD and to the field of HR. Mm -hmm. And of course, the main topic here is the field of leadership. Yes. And, um, you know, and, and Kelly, I'm really curious about your own experiences because you're, you're not a, a professional coach, you're a leader. Yes. who uses coaching, that which, is right. is, which is one of the reasons I wanted you on this panel. So I'm just curious, how, how has that experience been for you? You know, you're out there day in, day out, leading teams at GlaxoSmithKline and, and uh, you know, actually making things happen. Uh, how has it transformed how you lead? The, the transformation and really kind of the journey, because it's always in a learning process for me as well, of course, um, has been that the conversations that I have changed and continue to change. Yep. So when I, so I go back this, said it, uh, planning myself a little bit for today. I thought about when I, when I first took my first leader job, right. And I mentioned before presumptions of mentoring, consulting and answering every question that was right. That's a part of it. And as I've moved towards, really embedding principles of coaching and continue that that journey for myself what my conversations look like change why how people even approach conversations with me has changed um so 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 instead of looking to me necessarily to answer a question it might be just to springboard some ideas yeah. so that changes the the team dynamic it changes the interaction you're having with both direct line teammates yeah. as well as just other uh, colleagues Mm -hmm. um, and then you're also sought differently because what you're doing is you're actually bringing a different, different thinking process to whatever table you're standing at, sitting at or whatever, um, at, at, in your, in your day to day. Um, and I can feel that. And I've really felt it to be honest with you since I've taken on more formalizing my knowledge around this, um, because my own awareness to John's point is really like much higher, right? It's just much greater. And then my ability to articulate it is much better. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been very important. Excellent. It's like I can share it better. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Kelly makes an excellent point that, that, that if coaching is done properly, is applied mm -hmm. properly, um, if, if the investment that organizations make in coaching is deployed properly, it's going to transform the entire system. It's going to mm -hmm. have an enterprise-wide impact. And what Kelly was just talking about reminds me that uh, one of the greatest advantages to me as a leader, when I think of myself when I was a div divisional general manager at McGraw-Hill after my Disney years, um, and then now at the, in the SVP role in the human resources consulting firm in New York, is coaching stimulates curiosity. And that's one of the greatest things that with the new conversations that Kelly's talking about and these enhanced conversations that Kelly's talking about, people become more curious about each other. Mm -hmm. The direct result of coaching principles. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. And I, I love what the way you described it, Kelly, because I've also found my conversations have shifted tremendously over the years as I um, increase and continue to hone my own coaching skills. And one of the greatest things ties into John's point about curiosity is the ability to ask great questions. Yeah. Questions that have no assumptions of an answer that are just eliciting dialogue around helping people solve a problem. Um, that's been the, one of the most fun aspects of, of coaching and, you know, watching people have that proverbial aha, 
because you asked them a question that set them back and they went, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about that. You know, it's just, it really does begin as a leadership tool, begin to shift my own thinking and those that I interact with. Yeah. And coaching transforms. I mean, just the, the concepts and the principles that we adhere to as coaches and where ICF has been very, very brilliant in, in at least mm -hmm. bringing some competencies to wrap around this and some, some, form of informal governance to the, the process and the craft is <laughs> that when we um, when we are curious about each other, we can be curious and we can ask those questions, mm -hmm. as, as Marianne was just saying, without judgment. Yeah. You know, you can't, they're mutual exclusive. You cannot be in a genuine, authentic coaching relationship with mm -hmm. anyone and have judgment present. Yeah, and there, there was um, a great session last year at the Converge Conference yeah. on clean questions. Yes. It was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. It really makes you rethink <laughs> every question that comes out of your mouth. Yep. It's great. Excellent. So related to this, um, many people and leaders that are listening to this may want to know, how do I really uh, expand my knowledge and skills in coaching? Mm -hmm. so I'm curious how uh, each of you, you in your own experience, how your coach education and training contributed to your career as a leader. Well, I can just mention the, how I've kind of gotten to where I'm at um, <laughs> in my learning process. And cause I'm much, uh, much uh, at the earlier stages of than the, uh, than the, the Marianne and John, but, um, I mean, I, I think of it first off for me has been that I, I, I originally it was my own curiosities and my own self learning. So that starts you right you learning your le reading books, things like that. Um, and then honestly, the company that I work with does foster us uh, uh, this approach. And so um, I took opportunities that were available to me internally. Um, and so I would say in general, just in my training, in, in the learning process, uh, ensuring that you know what is available to you internally. I mean, that's right in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I had more aha moments, um, that's what prompted me. Um, I actually had taken a, another, gone through another program and had met somebody who's a faculty at Fielding. Um, and she really listened carefully to what I was trying to seek. Um, in my own learning process, and um, then she described Fielding University and the um, evidence-based um, direction of the program, and that really that really changed the way I was thinking about this, and that's when I really started to realize that it was a true discipline with the underpinnings of science, the skills, or have a certain art to them. I mean, it's its, its own discipline, mm -hmm. and so um, that's how my journey has been, and I, again, I know I'm in a much earlier phase, um, but it also brings an energy, and I, I want to mention that. Yeah. It just brings an energy, and I think that that's an important component of this entire talk conversation, too. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tag on to that. Uh, I'm a leadership nerd, if you will. So while all my friends are on the beach reading the latest novel, I'm reading the latest book on neuroscience. Uh, and things like that. So I think that's a big part of just who I am in general. Um, but like Kelly, it is a lifelong learning approach. Um, and that's how I go about it. But I will say this, so this is your unsolicited commercial, Terry. <laughs> my EBC experience to really hone my coaching skills. I've been at it for a number of years, had taken you know disparate approaches to learning how to be a coach. But my experience at fielding in the EBC program for leadership organiz and organizations was life-changing and transformative. And fielding's approach to building in the practicums, you know, when you go through a week of nonstop coaching practice observed by um, credentialed coaches and faculty and getting constant feedback and practice really drives it home. And so one of the things I took away from that, and you'd be proud to know, our cohort is still together. We still help each other. We have coaching calls. I'm in coaching circles with you know, women entrepreneurs who are starting businesses like I just am. Yeah. This whole notion of ongoing practice to hone your coaching skills, I will take to my grave. I just absolutely love it, and it's an onset of my fielding experience. Okay, well, thank you. 
Yeah. Fielding is a great experience. Once fielding, always fielding. Yes. <laughs> That's how right I am. I got my PhD nearly 20 years ago at fielding. And, uh, and I've always been involved in fielding, either in a faculty position or, or various positions um, on various councils and, and things like that. But uh, uh, my, my EDC, I was attracted to EDC because it's evidence-based. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of coaching, people believed in, in, in a wide variety of, of coaching training programs uh, across the country and around the world that this coaching is some kind of new phenomena. No, it's based on, <laughs> based on a lot of evidence and the evidence came. So I was a marriage and family therapist in California when I came out of Disney and when I came out of my executive position um, at McGraw Hill, you know, I was really thrilled about some of the books that we were publishing mm -hmm. and had developed relationships with authors and I wanted to get into my own way of craft my own way of combining my psychology, my system, of course, you know, marriage and family therapy is based on systems theory mm -hmm. and the familial systems and uh, uh, that and business to blend, you know, the principles of systems theory, uh, relational theory and business. And in those days, it was, it was really before Tom Leonard and all this stuff took off mm. in the 90s. Um, uh, that's what I went to Fielding Graduate University to do. More unsolicited advertising for Fielding <laughs> is it was a place with an open curriculum, self-directed curriculum, right. so that I could combine what I had done as as a, as a licensed MFT intern in California by the Board of Behavioral Sciences with business leadership development principles. So you know I was doing everything from Virginia Satir to Peter Block. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and trying to find a way to blend and weave all those together. And of course, the evidence-based coaching program at Fielding was a way to do that. They finally was, was a methodology, uh, not so much a methodology as much as a framework and a process, and an appreciative approach to how you can join these principles together in a very practical way. And lo and behold, here we are um, today looking at at organizations that will not survive without coaching principles. Mm -hmm. It can't be done anymore. Nope. Used to be coaching was coaching was discretionary. Oh, no. uh, you know, all the old school stuff and now it's just not. It's just mm -hmm. not. We must be um, we must be curious, inquisitive, genuinely authentically present people. Yep. To succeed in organizations. And organizations must adopt that culturally enterprise wide to succeed as organizations they're not they're not going to they're not going to be able to retain their talent you know they won't be sustainable or achieve the results yeah or achieve the results exactly, exactly. okay thank you all well, i'm going to open it up to the audience our live audience um, to any questions you may have so you have two options you can either uh, uh, turn on your microphone and ask your question or if you prefer you can type it into the chat room and I'll read it on your behalf. So who, who has a question for our esteemed panel? <laughs> it's Catherine. Welcome, Catherine. Uh, it's, it's less of a question really, but more uh, my agreement with um, how absolutely life-changing the uh, EBC program was for yeah. me. And John, um, I've heard you say a number of times the significance of personal awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, absolutely without question, um, that is something that uh, I notice is absolutely integral to my work. And yet at the same time, uh, it is also the, it's a constant journey. Because I noticed that depending on what's going on in my private professional life, whatever, you know, uh, that level of awareness, it ebbs and it flows. And, and uh, maintaining that, the, having a culture of coaching support, I think really helps to enhance uh, whether it's the people that we are supporting or enhance ourselves in terms of maintaining that level of awareness because um, things do happen and, and sometimes we fall off our mark. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I, I, that your point really resonates. 
Thank you, Catherine. Great. So, Joao, I know you have a, a typed a question in. Would you like to share that with the group? Yes, I could share it. Thank um, you. And uh, it's it's coming from a sense that um, somehow the, the ICF conferences, as they are stated, are not enough for the work we do. And the question is, do you think uh, there's other competencies or meta competencies that uh, you need for the work you do with leaders and in the space you work? Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, thank you. Um, I find, in, and I teach in some of, the, some of the seminars and workshops that I teach in the corporate world, you know, um, major insurance companies, major financial institutions, major um, pharmaceuticals, that we get ICF credential. You know, they can get CCEUs for those workshops awarded by ICF, of course. And the reason being because we tie the ICF competencies, core competencies, uh, and their application in complex organizations together. So everything is done in the context of the 11 competencies. Now they're, they're broad, and I think that's what I'm hearing you say, is that there can be a lot of other competencies and other disciplines. There can be other dimensions to them, but I think the ICF 11 competencies as they are, are a high level coverage and capture of essential components of the coaching craft. But within the competencies, yes, you can back out of that and, and, and reverse engineer out of that a lot of many, many more um, precise surgical uh, dimensions to the craft of coaching. But it all rolls up into, I think, the general competencies as they exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of, as, as uh, Catherine had just mentioned, the mercurial nature, you know, of uh, of you know what competency is appropriate for what situation under what conditions yeah. you know we have to be so <clears throat> in our application of the craft of coaching yep. yeah and i would add to that i don't know that it's that the current competencies are not enough as they're defined i think they are a very strong set as john just alluded to i do wonder however if there may need to be some additional expansions around things like ethical practices. So for example, the onset of artificial intelligence in coaching. Now we're bringing in a technology that we know today is riddled with bias. And there are a number of startup coaching software products yeah. that are on the market today True. that I'm not confident are protected enough that we have concerns about privacy, what's being shared, how it's being shared, how broadly it's being shared. Um, in addition to the biases that we know exist within the artificial intelligence, big data universe. Yeah. So I do, I don't know that it's more competencies or different competencies, but I do think that at some point, some of the competencies may need to be revisited and reviewed in the context of this evolving world of work and disruptive technologies. Oh, I agree, Marianne, with that so much because it, the 11 competencies have to be a living document. Right. Not a static document. Right, and the world is changing. Yeah, yeah, because everything is changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so that's a great point you make. Yep. It's not a static, nothing is static anymore. You know, Kurt Lewin used to talk about the feet, the, the freezing, unfreezing, yeah, right. freezing again, and, and, and no, nothing is ever frozen. It's too fluid, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's never frozen. So, Global warming and coaching. <laughs> so I, wouldn't, I, I guess what I'm warning against is don't abandon right. a solid foundation of competencies for coaching, but to make them a living, uh, as I said, a living document. That, that would work well. You know, they, need, they need to be evolutionary. Yeah, just to build on what the two of you have said so far, <clears throat> I see the competency as a foundation. Yeah. And it, if you read my most recent post on the EBC blog, 
um, you can get to it from uh, uh, fielding.edu forward slash blog. Um, it's on this concept of uh, the core competencies are really only one of the four pillars of evidence-based coaching. Yeah. Uh, it's the, uh, the uh, practices, uh, but we also have our theories mm -hmm. and our frameworks. Um, and those theories and frameworks are critical as well for evidence-based coaching so we understand why we're doing what we're doing. And every uh, specific um, specialty within coaching has its own unique theories and knowledge and expertise. So uh, in the field of leadership, obviously in our, our courses at Fielding, we're also talking about leadership theory yeah. and communication theory, emotional intelligence theory, and neuroscience theory, and how that applies to coaching. Yeah. And so that, yeah, your so four pillars concept is, is you're exactly right. And thank you for reminding us of that because the, it doesn't advocate the abandonment of competencies, mm -mm. the expansion on competencies. If I'm, right. if I, if I read the four pillars correctly, it's the expansion right. of competencies. Yeah. yeah and it's, refine it's, it. It's what you build on. I like to use the metaphor of a house. You know, the, the, the 11 core competencies are the foundation to the house, but no one's going to come over to your house if all you have is a slab, <laughs> right? Um, you, you need to have some rooms that you build on there and, you know, add some texture to it and maybe even a second floor or a third floor. Mm -hmm. And I see those as all of the theories and the practices and use of self and as well your expert knowledge of the client uh, being able to understand the context uh, as we know in systems theory to be able to really design an effective coaching engagement so to answer the short answer to your question from my perspective joe is that no there it's not enough uh, and it's not intended to be all there is it's intended to be a foundation that we all uh, across the entire global um, community of coaching use as a as a kind of that baseline Right, and then every different school, every different specialty in coaching has their own unique perspective yeah. and uh, their own knowledge and expertise uh, yeah. you know, that they go after. And that's one of the reasons why we have these professional series webinars every month is to give you a taste of that. You know, today we're talking about leadership. Uh, next month we're talking about healthcare. So wellness coaches have a completely different uh, mm -hmm. set of theories and knowledge and expertise that they bring with with their coaching to their clients so I know there was uh, one other quick question here that we have for today and that was from Deb and and her question was in building and sustaining a culture of coaching within the organization what forms of ROI or return on investment have you used or tried to show value has anyone, uh, I, I know Marianne, you've done probably a lot in this space. I would love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. Um, so on multiple levels, um, certainly when you're building it systemically into your leadership programs and practices is one level. Um, another is certainly at the individual level when you have, for example, we had uh, our executives in succession planning. So we look at the results and how successful those efforts were. We also make sure that in the coaching engagement itself, that the goals are tied to business performance outcomes, right? So leadership has a direct impact on your results, and we know that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from a tactical process standpoint, we always had a midpoint check-in to evaluate how it was going. And then we would have a formal survey at the end to evaluate the metrics around ROI and if we were actually hitting it or not. But the best form of ROI is when executives vote with their wallets. <laughs> so if they continue to run your programs because you can demonstrate impact on the business, impact for individuals, and that the programs you're actually creating are fostering a culture that drives performance, that's when you know you won. Great. Any other thoughts on uh, ROI? I just wanted to give Kelly a chance to yeah. speak She's to that GSK <laughs> if they have a formal way of approach. Yeah, I, 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 I'm much more at the <laughs> individual leader level here, so I, I, don't, I don't have to. I don't I'll tell you real quickly what, what, we've, dis what, what we've discovered and we're beginning to do is to challenge organizations to challenge us as a coaching provider 
Uh, you know, I've been a, I've been an executive at Disney. I've been an executive at McGraw Hill. Um, I've I've I'm currently an executive in, in human resources talent um, field, and if an if organizations constantly go through the comp reviews, every year there's a big comp cycle. Mm -hmm. They determine what an executive's value is to the organization, right? It's a, it's SOP for for organizations. So if they can tell me what their leader is worth to the organization, then we can have a baseline from which to say, well, how much will then a 10% increase in productivity, performance, and profitability be from that individual? Because you set the baseline. So unless you can tell us what that individual's worth to your organization, how can we have any metric with which to tell you what an improvement in that individual's performance is worth. So the organization's already done the work for us in their comp process. So the whole point about executive coaching is you make a leader a better leader. You know, so what will be what will be the metrics for how we tell this is a better leader? Mm -hmm. How much of an improvement was caused? And if we can tell what percentage, if there's some delta to how much of an improvement in that leader we have helped through coaching, mm -hmm. and just pin it back as a, as, a, as a percentage of what their comp is. Mm -hmm. Those are your numbers, not ours. Yeah. And we also used just one other thing was we followed somewhat of the Marshall Goldsmith model, which was if the feedback from others about the client in coaching had improved, that was another measure of success because you know, how they impact their teams and their peer groups right. and others when you're trying to help them evolve yeah. was another key metric. So that's the qualitative piece of it. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what is often challenged is what's the quantitative piece of it? What is yeah. coaching worth? What, is, what are we getting for this spend? The dollars. The dollars. And so we start with, well, what are the dollars you've already decided this individual yep. is worth? Yep. Great. Excellent. Go from there. <laughs> well, I just want to thank all of our panelists for coming out on a Saturday morning and spending their time with building and clearly all of you are very passionate about coaching and and leadership and the intersection of the two and uh, I just want to give uh, all of you uh, real acknowledgement for uh, your work that you are doing in the world and and your commitment uh, to the fielding program. So thank you very much and uh, I look forward to our continued partnerships as we go forward. Are thank people able to? Uh, yes. We need to thank Terry for his leadership. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. He's thank you. He's having a much more visible uh, entity across yeah. the country now. I, nice job, Terry. Yeah. Thank you all. Well, uh, to build on that, um, I do have a, a couple of short announcements. So I'm going to share my screen just so all of you can uh, see these. Uh, and uh, we have an ongoing program, as all, uh, most of you know, but for those who are new to fielding, our program is called the Comprehensive Evidence-Based Coaching Certificate Program. If you go to coach.fielding.edu, really easy to remember, just coach. You can access all of the different opportunities that we have. Oops, I think we have someone uh, having a, a phone call. If you could mute yourself, that would be helpful. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> all right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so here you can access uh, our upcoming live webinars like today's webinar. Um, we can also, we have a com coaching community of practice, which you are free to join. This is open to anyone who has passion around coaching. And there you are. Yeah, nice. Yeah. You can read about all of these uh, various uh, programs <gasps> that we have. Laura Hauser. <laughs> so the coaching community of practice is uh, available to anyone who would like to attend. We also have an upcoming a coaching conference that we want to make sure all of you are aware of. Uh, the coaching conference is on May 10th, uh, starts in the afternoon with some optional wine tasting and beautiful Santa Barbara. And mm -hmm. then uh, that evening, we're having a reception with the president of Fielding, uh, Dr. Katrina Rogers, and all of the faculty of the EBC program, and uh, many, many alums and current students will be joining us. Then all day Saturday, uh, May 11th, We'll have some exciting speakers uh, present uh, to uh, really educate us all on the latest trends in coaching and research. Uh, and you can uh, see all of our speakers on the website 
So if you want to know the website, you can get to it from coach.fielding.edu or it's also ebc-conference.fielding.edu. So ebc-conference.fielding.edu. We also want to invite you to our ongoing webinars. Every month we have two webinars. One is on research, which is often uh, put on by our PhD students who are sharing their research in coaching in particular. And you know, for those who don't know, Coach uh, Fielding is one of the global leaders in coaching research. We have more dissertations than coaching than almost any university in the world. Uh, so, and they continue to publish more. Uh, this is going to be from Linda uh, Pennington. She is an EBC grad and also now uh, a PhD grad from Fielding. She'll be uh, talking about her uh, research the client speaks, uh, what do executive coaching clients say in interviews about their coaching experiences. Uh, she also runs her own coaching school uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, so we're really proud to, to have her uh, be able to participate. You can read about her in her blog and then find information about that webinar, which will be March 20th, uh, coming up next month. We also have another uh, professional series webinar uh, coming up as well called uh, Coaching for Health, how coaching is transforming healthcare and wellness. So we have leaders in the healthcare world uh, who are also EBC uh, graduates, Janet Ottersberg, who is a health and wellness coach and has her own business, Lisa Perlman, uh, who works as a, as a senior HR business partner at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, California, uh, and then also a, a doctor, uh, a physician, Nazir Umrani, uh, who is a physician at the U.S. Naval Hospital, who's also a fielding graduate. So you can see how physician leaders are using coaching in their practice, which I think is an exciting new That story. sounds cool. Yeah, so please uh, sign up for this uh, or, uh, you know, let your colleagues and others know that this will be a very exciting professional series webinar on Wednesday, March 27th, 4 to 5 Pacific. Uh, lastly, if you would like to uh, uh, contribute in any way to one of these webinars, we are always looking for guest speakers and guest bloggers. Um, we have a blog at Fielding where we post uh, latest research as well as opportunities uh, for collaboration. And uh, that's where you can also see my recent article on the four pillars of evidence-based coaching if you'd like to explore more what Fielding means by that and our unique perspective on uh, evidence-based coaching. So welcome and thank you for, uh, well, I appreciate everyone coming today and we uh, hope to see you at our upcoming conference and our future webinars. And bye for now. Great. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.